Thank you very much for inviting me to this fantastic conference and this opportunity to come see this amazing work that's been happening here in Pakistan, so thank you. I wear two hats today, uh, both as a lecturer in conservation at the University of York, but also as a trustee of Earth Building UK and Ireland. So um, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the work that we do at the University of York in teaching, crafts and conservation sustainability, and then talk a little bit about some of that work that we do with Earth Building UK and Ireland as well. And so we've been teaching uh, conservation at the University of York since the very early 1960s. We were actually the first uh, courses that were taught actually just before the university was officially founded and in that time our course and our approach to teaching has changed a lot um, very much reflecting what's happening in practice and also reflecting what's happening in terms of research as well but I confess that I started out uh, just like John as an archaeologist and uh, I had the enormous opportunities of working on a very wide range of excavated uh, earthen archaeological sites and from there I, I developed my particular interest um, and, and love of all things built out of earth so I'm finding it very hard to, to sit here whilst I know there is earth and archaeology all out there as well so um, so it's great to be able to see that. But then uh, from that interest in excavated earth and archaeological sites, um, I became very much more interested in the material turn and understanding how materials work, understanding the practices that surround them from the use of modern earth mortars that we can use in conservation and right the way through to understanding some of the different materials that are used in construction. So uh, I have plenty of photographs of, of weird and wonderful things that you find in traditional earth mortars and traditional mud bricks. This is some uh, hair that's been used in earth plasters in England from the 17th century. And then from this interest in materials, I've become much more interested in some of the wider debates around conservation and where conservation joins crafts when we talk about uh, what we do when we're, uh, when we're in practice and when we're researching. And I think much of uh, the debate that has emerged in recent years in how we teach conservation, we can see emerging much earlier in the 19th and 20th century when uh, conservation teaching and architectural teaching and archaeological teaching uh, developed a difference, uh, a perception that there were people who thought we were the people who might uh, write plans, we might do the drawings and then there were people who do, who do things um, and this is shown particularly well uh, through this sculpture that's now on show in Liverpool Museum and this is just called the builder, in this case the hod carrier, the gentleman carrying the bricks and the architect Architect, the gentleman stood there watching, watching these things happen. Um, so this is a sculpture from the 1930s, but I think shows a really good way of, of thinking about this traditional mind-body split that has characterised so much of teaching. Um, but we now sort of uh, we're a little bit more sophisticated in how we approach conservation and approach the relationship between conservation and crafts because we know that uh, we don't ever see that split between thinking and doing. Rather, we know when we examine these cultures of vernacular building practices, we see people, craftspeople, are thinking with tools in hand. They're very actively engaged with materials and with other actors and with their environment. And so craftspeople are enhancing their own skills, they're broadening knowledge, and they're constructing social identities and professional status. This is very different to some of the literature you'll find on crafts. But actually conservation can still sometimes look very passive. Clearly this is not what is happening here, so, um, so I'm very pleased to see that. Um, Again, this is an image from some years ago showing a conservation architect looking at crafts happening around them.
So what we do at York, uh, we run two postgraduate programmes in conservation and within the limits of what we can do um, both from an institutional point of view but also from uh, sort of national educational frameworks of what we can do in postgraduate teaching we try to engage our students as much as we can with practical conservation work and we do that best through that very close engagement with craftspeople and with their materials and so we do that uh, by allowing our students to um, explore materials we do that uh, by allowing students to get involved with repairing walls, by uh, preparing and using traditional mortars. And for many of our postgraduate students, this will be the first time they've actually done any practical work of any sort that involves getting their hands dirty and thinking about how materials are working. And most of our students really enjoy it, so we're learning by doing. We're, we're trying to take some of those elements of crafts learning and put that into our postgraduate programme. And we find that that has its own particular set of challenges, um, mostly because we have to squeeze this into a, a very strict academic framework across our 12 months of teaching. But in the first six months of our teaching, all of our postgraduate students will be learning outside of the classroom, either through our practical skills modules or through site visits or through group work. So they'll be doing this uh, all the time. But then central to the rest of our teaching um, in York is the relationship between conservation and the climate crisis and the connection therefore to the sustainable development goals. And we see these uh, as really central to conservation as we connect the past, the present and the future, not just through that specific sustainable development goal that relates to cultural and natural heritage, 11, but also through the rest of the sustainable development goals because we think conservation and archaeology actually intersect with all of these sustainable development goals. And then whilst we've been doing this in our teaching, what I've really noticed uh, in 2019 is uh, what has happened and actually that great upsurge of interest in the climate crisis is really having an impact on our students and what our students want to be researching and where they want to be positioning themselves as they develop their careers. And much of the reaction in 2019 is a response to the uh, IPCC's report, so the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, who reported this time last year on the urgency of, the, of, of action if we were to keep within a world of just one and a half degrees of heating. And um, what we've seen in 2019 is um, a whole set of both direct action and also uh, governments and local authorities declaring a climate crisis emergency. So what I'm really, really inspired by is the fact that our next generation of conservation professionals are placing themselves within this environmental debate. And I see this now increasingly in the types of research our students are coming on to do. And so they're looking at a broader a range of environmental values and positioning those within building conservation. And so uh, through their independent research projects, uh, they might be looking at those limits, those, those ways in which we negotiate change in the historic environment. So this is an example of one of my students recently using our King's Manor base, so our beautiful uh, post-medieval set of buildings in the centre of York. And uh, alongside a whole set of uh, technical surveys to understand how uh, energy is uh, used and how energy performance is uh, changing across two different ranges of buildings, looking at all of those social sciences to think about how we value that set, that building, and to think about those limits of change, what it is that we uh, are prepared to accept for that built fabric in relation to that uh, climate change. And so there are some photographs here just showing the variations in heat loss from on the one side uh, the top picture is our 1960s uh, building called the Fielden building uh, designed by Bernard Fielden in the 60s uh, a concrete and brick structure which uh, performs very poorly and then that contrasts with uh, one of the uh, 17th century uh, wings in the in King's Manor and you can just see how uh, how that uh, 
wing built mostly out of stone uh, retains uh, its uh, heat better. We also uh, see this change in some of the workshops that uh, we've been able to deliver as well. And so we've been doing this in Ahmedabad, uh, doing some rapid documentation of the city walls there. I'm just going to quickly go through the rest of these examples here. And then through Earth Building UK, we uh, are a small charitable organisation and we run workshops and uh, try to engage people in both the crafts and the the uh, training needs for new vernacular buildings and this is both for conservation purposes but also for new building purposes as well and then I'm just going to go back one very very quickly I also now have a, a, a student who's going to be looking at the history of sustainability using the example of the Centre for Alternative Technology which was set up in the 1970s as one of our first off-grid communities um, and they're going to be looking at the history of the Centre for Alternative Technology to look at how uh, perceiving things as heritage can help with those negotiations around behaviour change that we need to uh, start uh, engaging with as we deal with the climate change crisis. For example, they have the very first wind turbine that was used in the United Kingdom and actually if we look at that as an archaeological site that might help us uh, engage with some of those discussions around limits of change with new uh, uh, wind turbine applications. And so just uh, finally, just to say thank you very much for inviting me to come uh, to this conference and sorry I have slightly overrun. Thank you.